Welcome to The Meetings Podcast, the meeting organizer's podcast source for what's new in the meetings and events industry. Meetings Podcast is a conversation with a variety of voices that looks at events, meetings, and media. Meetings Podcast is sponsored by IMAX America, America's worldwide exhibition for incentive travel, meetings, and events. Hey, podcast listeners, today's show is brought to you, of course, by IMX America, but we also have a new technology sponsor. Well, it's not to that new, but full disclosure, I'm an investor and founder in AV for Planners, and AV for Planners is designed to help meeting organizers vet and negotiate AV. We did a slight pivot this year. Um, our clients, who we have now, really love our service, uh, but they're having a hard time finding out how to pay for it, so we did a slight pivot, and now... We are shifting gears, which we have shifted gears, and we are going with third-party planning companies who now provide this service to ensure their clients are getting the correct AV and labor. It's really been a great shift for the business. Um, We're working with some really big companies, which is really fun. Um, So how it works is they, you know, the third-party planners now get a commission from the AV companies for bringing in bringing in the business. So it sound, if it sounds familiar, it's just like what they do for room blocks with, with hotels. So here's how it works. On behalf of a client, AV Planners gets the in-house AV and two outside AV bids. They can get three outside AV bids if you want, but usually they want to get the inside, in-house AV. But we put all three of them side by side and give the client a one-page summary with a rating of all the equipment and labor for the proposal. Behind that one pager is all the reasons why we made decisions for all the different areas of the lighting, for the sound, everything that you can think of, uh, the labor, um, and they can use that to make better decisions. Um, so third-party planner, uh, third-party planning companies are using it. Also, some independent planners are doing the same thing so they can make a little more revenue off the event while getting the best equipment and labor for their clients. So... Um, if you're interested in learning more, head over to avforplanners.com uh, backward slash AV Power Pack uh, just to sign up for a consultation if you want or just get some information. Uh, plus get tips and tricks for site surveys and what to look out for, which is just an added bonus that's on there. Also, we have a nice clause to add to your hotel contract if you want more control over what you're being charged for audiovisual from the venues and hotels. So let's get into the show and thank you so much for listening. Welcome back to the Meetings Podcast. This is Mike McCallan from, where am I from? Grass Shack Events and Media. And today we have Jordan Schwartz. Hi, Jordan. Mike, good to talk to you. Nice to talk to you. You are the president of Pathable. You build event apps and conference community platforms for over eight years. That's true. Uh, Prior to that, you served uh, Microsoft for a decade, building consumer-focused products, including several versions of Windows and MSN. Uh, you also lead a team of 60,000 bees in the manufacture and production of delicious organic honey. As do you, Mike. I do. How, how I do. The bees, how the bees doing? Doing well? This year was uh, probably our best year ever. Wow, fantastic. I think we got about 15 gallons of honey. Wow, that's great. It was okay. a lot. I did well, not do as well, but that's because we were gone for uh, – we were overseas for the spring, so I didn't get to uh, get things set up. The girls were on their own. and You weren't there to give them their massages and things, making sure they're... Right, their pep talk. Pro- yeah, producing. Um, I don't really do anything to my bees. They're very organic also. I don't medicate them or anything. I just let them do their thing. Same thing. And do you still have the chickens? No, the chickens, uh, when we, we, so, so we spent three months in Europe uh, this spring, and uh, I gave away the chickens before we left, and uh, my wife uh, requested that we not get them back because I kept letting them free in the yard, yeah. and then it made it hard to walk. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Our next-door neighbors have them, and the eggs are great, but they bring in a lot of rats, and they also poop everywhere. That's, that's the thing. That is yeah. the thing. All right. Well, let's get to this, Jordan. I appreciate you talking to me today. Um, do you have a favorite quote? Uh, you know, the one that I'm, I'm going with today is fail fast. I think that's been said before. 
on the podcast. Oh, is that right? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's a good one. It's a good one. We just, I mean, it's kind of top of mind. We, we just had a kind of a big experiment here at Passable and, uh, and it didn't work, um, but it didn't work quickly. And I'm just, you know, that's, that's how I sleep at night is, is patting myself on the back for, for recognizing that and for, for moving, for making decisions. And I think that's a great, it's really something to learn. And I have had that recently with our AV for planners thing. We've been working on that for a couple of years now and um, failing pretty good at a lot of it, but actually pivoting that pivoting now and it's actually working. And it's just like, I wish we had really discussed it with, um, you know, the users first, like really done a good, good. we, We just thought, Oh, they'll love this, which is not the way you can do it. If you build it, they don't come. Right, right. No, you got it. You got to spend a lot of time. That's and when I got started at Microsoft, I spent my first two years there, sitting behind a one-way mirror, watching people use software and just and studying it and, uh, uh-huh. and making a science of it. And so that's uh, very much user research and usability research, very much in my blood. And yeah, there's just no Smart. substitute. I mean, you can you stare at the wall, you stare at the ceiling. You got you got dreams, and they get blown away by you know, 10 minutes of an actual person who doesn't have your same vision, just trying to get their work done. Right, 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 right. Mm. Um, but good quote. Thank you. Thank you for coming, being prepared. I appreciate that. Um, so how'd you get into this industry? How'd you pick the events industry? How did this whole, I, you said you started at Microsoft or I read that before. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, uh, I was, so I was in psychology, uh, origi- uh when I was in, uh, grad school and, uh, I started doing some moonlighting for Microsoft as a graduate student, uh, doing this re- usability research that I was just talking about. Uh, and then you know, somewhere along the way, I realized that not only did I enjoy the process of creating software more, um, but it was just, it was such a greater opportunity for impact. You know, when I, when I was writing these academic papers, if I, if I was really successful, you know, 10, 15 people in my field might read it. And after a few years, maybe I'd get quoted in another journal article. And that was it. That was like, that's success. That's hitting it out of the park. Whereas when you create software, uh, you know, if I can make something 5% easier to do, or I can enable, you know, grandmothers to connect with grandchildren in a way that they weren't able to, I, I, I can impact millions of lives and that opportunity to, to have a, a more meaningful impact on, on the world, I think is, is what attracted me to software. And then I, once I had been at Microsoft for 10 years, I decided that was long enough to spend uh, at one place. And uh, as I was casting around for the next thing to do, a couple friends of mine had prototyped a early version of Pathable uh, with this idea that we've all been to, to conferences and it's just, especially coming from Microsoft. I was so excited about going and meeting the other people that were creating the future. And I was going to you know, form these alliances and share information. And we were going to have all night bull sessions is, you know, dragging ourselves in for the keynotes and, and it was really, it was kind of a disappointment because I would go to the conferences and I would get a name badge and, you know, a drink ticket. And then I would just be afloat in this sea of faces. And I didn't know who to talk to. Uh, I didn't know who, and I knew that there were these opportunities of great connections to make. And I just didn't know who they were. Um, and so the early versions of Passable were really focused on solving that problem. Finding the helping attendees at conferences find the right people to meet and connect with them before, during, and then stay connected after the event was over. And that just seemed like like such a a worthy uh, worthy problem to solve. Yeah, it's the, the community aspect of it is so huge, and so many times they don't do anything. I mean, I've been in the same spot, really excited about going to a conference, and then it's just. I ended up talking to the same guy the whole time. Yeah, but that, I think that was me at the last one. I think it was, yeah. yeah. Then I was on a bus with you somewhere. It was strange. Anyway, um, so what was the um, what's been the biggest challenge? So you left a good job to start a start out on your own, right? 
what was the biggest challenge of, through all of that 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 leap? For maybe someone else is listening right now and they've been working at Microsoft for ten years and they want to start. I mean, what was the what was the biggest challenge you encountered? Well, there are so many to choose from. Uh, I would say that the the biggest thing was coming from a company like Microsoft, where I was able to focus on one job and just I can nail that job. And there were people who took care of everything else. There was a mm-hmm. test team, there was a development team, engineering team, there was the marketing team, there was the HR team, and everything is kind of magically. Everything would magically happen around me, and I could just I just nailed my one thing. That was, that was it. And if if the product uh, if something went wrong with the product because of somebody else, I still got paid, you know. Uh, and and <laughs> I'll tell you. I, I, at Microsoft, there a couple times there were problems with software products. I don't, you, I don't know oh, if any of that made it that. to the press, public <laughs> consciousness. Uh, but uh, we had a few problems. But but it was it, it never it didn't impact me personally. And so going and you know running my own business, where you know not only is it the case that if if I didn't make something happen, it wouldn't happen until I had you know, started to build a team. Um, but also, it didn't matter whose fault it was when something failed. If it failed, it was going to hurt me badly. Mm-hmm. And so it was important that uh, it, it just it, it meant I had to pay a lot more attention to all of the different pieces. Yeah, I run into that with my business is getting paid and things like you have to be the you know, you have to be the friend of your client, but then you also got to like, can you please pay me? So there's this, I always, recently I have, have a bookkeeper who can make that call and be, and then I'll say, oh, I'll talk to that bookkeeper. I don't know why she keeps bothering you, but. Yeah, really, it's, it's out of my hands. It's out, I'd love to give you a break, but it's out of my hands. But I hear what you're saying because it is all those little things. That's a, that's a huge challenge. Um, so tell me the moment you knew that you had made the right decision in doing this. Is there like an aha moment where you were like, you know, sitting with your bees and you thought, you know, yeah, I, you know, I, I would say it was, uh, I, I don't know if I can point to any single one experience, but yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll run into people who have been at an event that have used passable and they'll say, to me, Oh, you, that, that's yours. And they'll start telling me about how they were able to use it in English in exactly the ways that I wanted them to use it. You know, I connected with people. I used it for these conversations beforehand. I you know, booked these meetings and it was, God, why doesn't everyone use that? And then just, it just gets a little glow. It lasts about 10 minutes. And then. <laughs> Cause I remember the first time that I did talk to you is because I, I had used Pathable. I don't know if it was, I had you on the podcast ago or where we met, but I remember that was why I wanted to meet you. Cause I love the, the, I love pathable like i thought this is cool because exactly what you were saying and i'm not blowing smoke up your ass i appreciate that mike thank you um okay so now let's say someone's listening right now tell me what's going on with pathable tell us you know kind of take somebody through uh the beginning of wanting to use pathable and what exactly it does kind of in a layman's terms. So if someone's listening and goes, what the hell is yeah. pathable? Well, and, I'll, uh, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a, a, a historical up through the future view. So when we started, it was, this is before iPhones. Okay. And we, we've been around for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, and mm-hmm. so mobile wasn't a thing back then. And we were focused on building communities for events trying to build, think about, you know, Facebook for a conference. You want to know who else is going. You want to start conversations with them. You want to connect with them. You want to find the right people while you're there. And you want to keep the conversations going afterwards. And that's what we did. And then mobile happened uh, and really started to dominate people's consciousness about when they think about event technology as mobile, mobile, mobile. So we expanded and became a community platform and mobile event app. But somewhere along the way, the event app piece and just putting the agenda online, putting the maps online, putting, you know, on your phone began to eclipse everything else in, in terms of importance. Uh, And also other companies noticed the same thing. And really, honestly, the, the market has become saturated with event apps. There are, there are literally hundreds of them and, 
they all, there's a, a common core set of things that they all do, right? They'll all put the agenda online. They'll all let people choose their meetings. They'll all let people uh, look at maps and exhibitors, things like that. So, you know, we had to ask ourselves, how, why are we different? Why are we better? Because I don't want to, I'm not interested in, uh, in just trying to be the, the cheapest solution uh, and just crank out apps uh, the way, which, which is a, I mean, it's a, it's a fine model for, for others, but that's, that wasn't the business that, I, I, that I'm interested in solving. I'm really interested in, in creating something great. Uh, and so as we look forward, we're continuing to focus on networking, but we, I, I, we're looking away from the kind of Facebook gamification uh, approach and thinking more about uh, private meeting scheduling and structured meetings and taking advantage of some of the unique qualities of in-person conferences, trade shows, and meetings. So I'm going to be there. I got three days when we're going to be sharing a physical space. And during that time, I don't want to be looking at my phone. I don't want my attendees to be looking at, my, at their phones. I want them to be taking advantage of the fact that they're there physically together, looking at each other's eyes. And we want to enhance and facilitate that. So we're, we're expanding into that meeting facilitation, uh, one-on-one uh, planned structured meetings, uh, that type of thing. Very cool. And that's, that's where you're headed. That's where we're headed. So we already have a, a great base and it, it, what we're finding is that, uh, that's what people are coming to us for is they look around the market. There really aren't, there, there is not another strong solution for that problem of I'm going to a meeting. Yeah. I got limited time. There's a bunch of people I want to meet with. How do I, how do I meet with the right people while I'm there? And, you know, that extends to hosted buyer type scenarios um, and other kind of one-on-one structured meetings where the event organizer has an interest in uh, uh, facilitating those meetings and, and monetizing them as well. Yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. And, and I have to say, I went to one conference years ago and it was like one of these podcast conferences and it was like in Ontario and they had a, just a community board where you could sign up for meetups with people. You put, I'm interested in this, Yeah, right. you know, it was fantastic. And that, and I, that, from that meeting, I have, I still have great friends from that. Like just those, you know, cause we were all kind of nerdy dudes walking around, right. you know, it was the unconference. So approach is that right people would yeah yeah i mean we that was the main conference but they had yeah they had a thing where you could just say i'm interested in you know podcasting or whatever i guess it was more of a media conference anyway it was really great and i understand what you're getting at i think it's fantastic that's what meetings need more of um so take me through a typical day. Do you have like morning rituals or anything, uh, something, you know, exercise, web stuff? Do you go to the certain websites every morning and look at stuff? What, what's, what makes Jordan? I, I, I ask this only because I'm trying to get like what are successful people doing in, oh. you know, in the day? Well, I, I'll tell you what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can answer your question. Uh, yeah, so I, I, spend, uh, I spend about an hour every morning uh, with my seven-year-old. Uh, just lying on the on the rug playing Legos or whatever it is he's doing. Um, that's kind of an important uh, beginning to to my day. Uh, and then I, I think that the kind of most interesting thing for me is that I I got a treadmill desk, so I spend the morning while I'm working uh, walking. Um, and you know I had found for a long time I'd go on long bike rides and you know get the creative juices flowing and I think of things and I have these like, elaborate ideas and, you know, I kind of write things in my head and fine tune it. Uh, and I'd get back and there was always this narrow, maybe 20 to 30 minute window where I would try and commit this genius to paper or, or to, yeah. um, and then, then it was lost. And I always felt like it was just such a shame that I couldn't be typing, that I couldn't be creating while I was, exercising while I, because I, I think mm-hmm. there is, there's really that mind body connection there. Uh, and so I, I started off by getting a treadmill off a of Craigslist and built a, a desk around it and, uh, recently upgraded to, a uh, you know, off the shelf 
commercial treadmill desk. Um, and it's oh, great. Nice. I, I can just sit there and work. There, there's a set of tasks that it lends itself very well to, uh, and a set that are kind of more deep thinking, hard problems. I tend to have to stop at it. It uh, jiggles my memory a little bit, but for creative, open-ended kinds of uh, tasks and certainly phone calls, things like that, it's fantastic. I mean, it gets gets my blood up and gets my juices flowing. Um, it, it changes my day, sets me on the right course. That's very cool. And I had one in here for a while too, but my wife took it to work, which is too bad. She stole it. And now all her people use it at work. It's kind of unfair. Um, <clears throat> all right. So what did you want to be as a kid? I, you know, I think I, 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 I not when I say a politician, I don't want a politician, but uh, it's something somewhere, something like a lawyer or a senator or something like that. I wanted, I was always very logical, nice. um, and I cared a lot about uh, how the world worked, and I wanted to be involved in that. I think I, I was involved in computers for. I mean, my whole life, I, you know, I learned to program in fifth grade and we got our, we got our first Apple II in 1976. It was, you know, right off the line, it was serial number 179, something like that. It was, it was really, <laughs> uh, I, and I, you know, I, I was typing my homework as a fourth grade, you know, I'd hand it in on these little dot matrix printer printouts. Um, <laughs> but uh, it really never occurred to me until, um, to graduate school that, that I could make a, that that would be a, uh, software and computers would be a career for me. What do you know? Do huh? You know? Nowadays, yeah. everybody, that's what yeah. they do, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, what book do you gift other people? Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't keep books in general. If I, I get a good book, I, 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 I always I always give them away. Um, I, I think mm-hmm. that the one that I've given away the most, because I'll, I'll reacquire it, reread it, and give it away, the, the man who took his wife for a hat. I just, that one's brilliant. Oliver Sacks, uh, and he, he's a uh, neurologist who works in very unusual cases. Recently just passed away a few months ago. Um, well, he's at Awakenings. Exactly. Movie. Yeah, he's a, he – Right. Robin Williams played him in Awakening. Mm-hmm. Um, and he helps to, he under, helps us understand how the brain works by observing how it uniquely breaks. So, you know, if you realize that someone can lose the ability to understand speech, but can still generate speech, or can lose the ability to recognize a face, but still see perfectly in all other ways, then you realize that understanding speech and generating speech are two separate parts of the brain, or that there is a specific part of the brain that is dedicated to recognizing faces because it can break. It's, it's just super fascinating book. He's a wonderful writer. Very cool. And that's interesting too, because you, so you have the psychology major, right? But then you graduate school, were you still psychology? Yeah, all the way through. I'll see. All the way, but then you went into computers. Computers, yeah. Which I, I, but, but, now, but now you're in the kind of matching people. Yeah, it's, it's still I mean, social. Psychology, right, it's, all, it's the same. Understanding yeah, how people yeah. work and trying to help them work better, maybe. Is that mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, give it to me. No, it makes sense. What, uh, what, do you listen to any podcasts that you really like? Yeah, I'm, I'm listening to one right now, uh, a, a History of Rome um, and I think that's what it's called. It's History of Rome. It's a you know, 150 episode. Uh, really? Yeah, it's, it's, wow. it's fantastic. What, what happened is when I was so this past spring, uh, I, we pulled our seven year old out of school, uh, my wife and I, and rented out our house, and we went and lived in Europe, uh, in Portugal and Spain, uh, for about three months and traveled around. And while we were traveling, there was a lot of time when my son wanted to be entertained. And so I would tell him, I would tell him stories and history about where we were, uh, which mostly involved me digging um, 
my 11th, you know, out of my brain, the results of my 11th grade uh, Israel, Greece, and Rome history class, <laughs> which was really, I mean, I, that teacher was fantastic. I mean, it, a lot of it stuck. Um, but I, I ran out of things pretty quickly, and I had to go on, you know, Wikipedia and, and other sources and try and remind myself. Um, but he enjoyed it so much that uh, I decided to, to try and do that some more. And so I've been listening to this podcast and then retelling him uh, some slightly sanitized versions of of the story as we go. And you know, whenever whenever we've got a break, and he says, "Dad, tell me, tell me about Rome." All right, tell me about Rome. <laughs> That's great. That's totally great. So, and are there any other ones, or that's the that, that's, that's the main one? No, I don't. Um, I I just I haven't really gotten into podcasts as much. I mean, except yours, obviously, which is, you know, that's that's daily. That's a <laughs> shower every morning. Wow. Do you have brown eyes? I can't even see. <laughs> no, you don't. Interesting. Um, oh, have you ever had a nickname? Uh, Jojo. 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 Why'd they call you Jojo? Don't you don't know? Oh, look, I just, uh, I can see Ron Ellington has just is joined this podcast uh, and he is one of the group of people who calls me Jojo. Hi, Ron. Oh, interesting. That's cool. Uh, what's your favorite music artist? Uh, I don't know that I have a specific favorite. Well, well what kind of like Pandora or Spotify or whatever? What do you so what I've been listening to? The Pandora your... station I've been listening to the most recently is uh, Scott Bradley. Uh, he, he, he takes, um, uh, mid century, um, blues and, um, bebop and, um, those types of songs and, uh, or, or I'm sorry, he takes modern kits and recast them as if they were mid century bebop and, and blues. Uh, it, it's a lot of fun, uh, and and there are so it's kind of almost like electro swing uh, influenced, but versed. So when you're working, do you have like music on? Do you I when can't. you you don't no, nothing, keep it silent? Yeah, just it's quiet. I just I lose myself in my thoughts. All right, and do you have a favorite documentary or movie you've seen lately? I honestly, I don't watch. Uh, I just I don't watch a lot of movies. You don't. You're 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 playing with the boy. Right. Try to, but the boy must be watching movies. No, we try and limit screen time. We're, we're, we're yeah. I'd rather I've been you know I'm teaching him chess. We've been playing a lot of chess together. Oh, that's we, great. You know, we play a lot of a lot of make believe. So, what's the best advice you've ever received? Fail fast. <laughs> Who gave you that advice? Uh, everybody, everybody. Uh, what's working for you right now? Do you have a new, like something you're using that's an app or a vitamin or a, uh, uh, I guess you said your desk is working for you. Yeah, the, the, uh, the treadmill desk is working for me. No, I mean, in terms of workflow, I really, I've got a, uh, just a plain vanilla text editor that where I keep my to-do list and okay, every morning I I look at it. I do a little sort on things that mm -hmm. I need to do and start at the top and move down. And that's do you, uh, at like Pathable, do you use like Slack or one of those yeah. things yeah, there to, to, to get, and that's working yeah, pretty that's, good? Yeah, that's working. I mean, I, I love Slack. I, we were using a tool up until recently called Squiggle uh, that's similar to Slack, but it would take a, uh, it would use your webcam to take a picture of you every minute so and post it so you could see everyone you were working with and it wasn't video so you wouldn't see them picking their nose necessarily um, but uh, you could see you could see if they were uh, their brow was furrowed you could see if they'd walked away so the, one of the problems that I have with slack is I'll ask somebody a question and they don't answer are they do they not, are they, have they gone to lunch? Are they, you know, they won't, it's hard to get a real sense of who's there and who isn't. I mean, you know, it signs people out, sure, but uh, if someone leaves it open, I, I don't have a sense of what they're doing or whether they're there. And so this, that sense of presence I found really useful. 
And you don't use the Skype either then for work? I use Skype or do you? for uh, chat it up. Yeah, I mean, because so we're the, an entirely virtual office. Everybody, we, we don't mm-hmm. have a physical office. Everyone works from home. I got uh, my, my um, co-founder and CTO is uh, living in the Dominican Republic right now for two months. And then he's heading to Uruguay after that. And then he'll come back and, and be in Seattle. And I, I worked the three months when I was in Europe. So we, we really take advantage of the fact that you don't, we don't have to be physically together. But as a psychologist, I appreciate the importance of being able to see someone and yeah. you know, make eye contact and all that in terms of building relationships. And, um, and so, yeah, we do a lot of video Skype. I use GoToMeeting um, and other tools like that to ensure not just that we're transferring information, but that we're building relationships because I, I think that's important to a team. That's really interesting because I have the same problem. We use Slack and Skype, but it is like, where are you? You know, yeah. that's the whole thing when you need something. Yeah, exactly. It's very, very interesting. Okay. So, um, what's your favorite event to go to first industry event and then, um, regular like whatever event right. is it well so industry event i mean i'll, I'll be going to uh pcma's convening leaders uh coming up in in just a few nice uh that's that's always a good one it, it feels like a, a gathering of the of the clan um you know for everyone a lot of familiar faces yours included mm-hmm. um and then for fa- favorite event i i've been going to burning man for uh, this will be uh, for 15 years now. I guess I skipped two, so I've, I've done 13, 13 years in all uh, since I started. Uh, nice. And it's just, it also feels like a, a gathering of the clan, but it, it's uh, oh, it's just such a good time. And you know, meet interesting people, see interesting art. They come back inspired uh, and exhausted, uh, but it's yeah, it's well worth it. Yeah, I have a meet, I have a podcast with somebody who's the head of the medical for Bernie Man coming up. Oh yeah, that minute. Yeah, I'm, I'm blanking on his name. Tell him, tell him or her I say hi. Uh, we've got, uh, <laughs> and it was, it's nice actually. We uh, Burning Man has a uh, global leadership conference where they bring together the leadership from their uh, kind of worldwide network of um, local groups. Um, and Pathable is powers that event, which uh, oh, it's, cool. really, it's, it, it means a lot to be able to, to give back in that way. That's very cool. Yeah. Sharice, who works with me here, um, at Grass Shack, she goes every year. I always wanted to go. We almost went last year, year before last, because I always wanted to go. Um, but my wife got bronchitis really badly. And so we kind of pulled out at the end, which was too bad. I really wanted to go. 2016. I've always wanted to go. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe so. Um, What's the, what do you, what do you think's the coolest new trend or what, what are you excited about coming up in the future here with, uh, let's talk about the events. What do you, where do you see, what do you think's cool out there? Uh, do you have anything that's really like, well, wow, that's pretty cool. In term, in, for events uh, and technology? Mm-hmm. Just in general. In general. You mean, it could be technology. It could be just, you know, hey, people are friendlier. Uh, it's a good world out there. The, uh, so <laughs> I, uh, a friend of mine uh, started a company recently uh, called Glowforge. And Glowforge is taking laser, it's taking laser cutters and making it, um, more home accessible. So you can make physical objects, cut physical objects in your home in the way that you might with your, uh, with your home printer. Uh, really? Yeah. yeah. It's, and it's, I mean, the, the, the demos are incredible. Um, so, you know, one thing you can do is you take a, a piece of wood or a cardboard, you know, any physical thing and you draw on it you can put it into the device and the device will scan it and then laser cut your drawing. Wow. So, but what that means is not only, or you can download, you can you know, take a picture with your camera and put in your, your laptop 
and it will etch the photo that you took into the case of your laptop. You know, holy crap! And, and so you can, That's cr- yeah. <laughs> so what are kind of things that, that that kind of thing where you can just personalize everything? You can personalize that you everything, right? So you know, you know wallets. I mean, kind of all of Etsy will will shortly be revolutionized by by this thing. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of making things too, I mean, you can take a, a, a blueprint for something, uh, you know, that is that that can start two dimensional. At least has pieces that are two dimensional that can be reassembled, and you just you can make them. I mean, you can I can and you can make them out of any physical thing that you have. Uh, so I'm I'm really excited about that. It's it's. There, the beta has just come out. I'm, I, I'm waiting for my device uh, still, um, but he he crowdsourced the creation of it, so you know had people pre-buy it as a way to fund the the first version. I think so, twenty nice. twenty five million dollars in product and wow, crowdsourcing it. That where did he do that? Like on Kickstarter or one of those he, things? He, he or was built that like- his own. I asked I asked, talked about that. So why why didn't he use Kickstarter? And there were a few things that he wanted, like. Uh, incentives. So if I recommended, you know, if I referred other people who then bought it, I would get some kind of thank you. And I think Kickstarter didn't support that. And so uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Kind of a little affiliate kind of thing. Huh? Yeah. Affiliate sort of thing. Um, I was going to ask you one more question about Pathable. So what is the most popular thing about pop, uh, about Pathable? Cause I, I know it does a lot of things. So What's the most popular thing? What's the most? If someone's listening to right now. They say, "What you know? What would what would they? What would they like the most?" Yeah. So I mean, if, if you yeah. think about uh, it, it's an event app, and so it does all the things that event app does. It puts your agenda online. It lets people choose their meetings. It lets exhibitors and sponsor listings and maps. And everybody does that. The thing that we do that really gets the most accolades is connecting people in real meaningful ways. And that you know, doesn't mean gamification and running around and getting points. It means uh, creating opportunities for people to engage in real discussions with people who share their interests uh, and facilitating them connecting when they're at the event. So we make events more successful because we recognize that the reason that people go to events is to share the physical space and share relationships and build relationships with their fellow attendees. Is there any, uh, uh, I know you have a lot of case studies on your, you have a really good website too. I like your website with all the webinars and everything. It's very cool. Um, Thank you. Are there any, any shows coming up that you are going to be, that anyone would uh, be able to try it out or how does that work? I guess they get a demo from you right away if they go onto your yeah, site. Yeah, and we have, we have tests, uh, you know, d- demo sites where you can download the app and, and try it out and, and you get a, an account at a, a, um, a, a mythical, we have a, a green con green energy conference that doesn't actually exist, but it's the best event that doesn't exist in the world. And it has all the bells and whistles and lets you try things. You know, <laughs> actually something that we added recently that I'm, I'm excited about. So we added uh, live polling. So speakers can go and create polls for the audience and, you know, project the results and every again that's i think it's fairly standard one of the things that i've noticed is when there are panel discussions uh or they take questions from the audience at events and you've got this huge audience and everybody they put out a microphone in the uh in the the aisles and then people line uh-huh. up the microphone and they step up and they ask their question and it's it's always such a debacle because you know someone will wait in line, they wait in line, they wait in line, and then they get up and their question is, you know, I'd, I'd like you to comment on my research and how does what you're talking about relate to this anecdote that I'm about to tell you about me? And it, you miss the good questions. So we built a questions from the audience tool into the app so people can suggest their questions. Everybody gets to see everyone else's questions. They can vote questions up. There's a moderator view where the moderator can then see all the questions that people are asking, see what the most popular ones are. So, you know, 10 people have the same question. You don't have to have 10 people lined up with a microphone to ask it. Right. That's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. So I'm really excited about that one as well. Now, is that projected? That comes on the moderator's phone or everybody sees it, I guess. Everybody sees it. Uh, 
Sorry, I, don't, I was trying to picture how Every, it would be. So, so everyone they, can see the questions uh, so that they can vote them up or down. Up or down, yeah. But, oh, and then the moderator has a view where they can delete inappropriate questions. Uh, they can mark questions as answered so that they don't appear anymore. And, you know, some tools like that. That's very cool. Very cool. All right, last question. Um, let's see. If you could talk to the high school senior you, what would you tell yourself? Buy Facebook. <laughs> no, I... <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. I think so. I Take more risks. I mean, I, I think I, I've done fairly well at um, not not taking the obvious easy path and and uh, taking you know, starting my own company, going just mm -hmm. you know creating art things like that. But uh, I think that there are certainly things that I wish I had spent more time on in my life uh, that I haven't done because I was afraid that. I would do them poorly or people wouldn't like the result. Uh, and the times when I, when I've gotten over that, you know, I've either been successful and patted myself on the back or failed fast. So uh, right. either way. I was going to say that as you, as you were saying that I was thinking, Oh yes. Yeah. Fail fast. Always comes back to failing fast. Right. All right, Jordan, where can people find you? Passable. P is in Paul, A T H A B L E dot com. And we're finding paths between people, passable dot com. Right. And they can find you on Skype at oh, I'm Jojo Schwa. Jojo, Jojo Schwa. Schwa. You're not at, at Pathable anymore, huh? You have someone else being the Pathable person. Right, yeah, I don't know on Twitter. We're uh, Pathable on Twitter. Um, passable dot for events on Facebook. Um, nice. You know the social media places. Yeah. Oh, and uh, we're on Google. You can find us. On You're on the Google. <laughs> wow, how'd you get on there? Oh, that's. I need you have to fill out some sort of form. I don't know about that. All right, Jordan. Thanks so much. I really appreciate your time, and um, I will talk to you again. I guess I'll see you soon. Mike, always a pleasure. Okay. Bye bye. Okay, it's always great to talk to Jordan. He is an awesome dude, and if you get a chance to talk with him at, at um, upcoming shows or um, through actually the Pathable website, make sure you do. He's really knowledgeable about um, where events and technology are going. Um, I want to thank IMEX America for sponsoring the show once again, and of course, AV for Planners. Check out AV for Planners if you're interested in getting the right equipment and labor for your show. And, and if you're a third-party planner or a, a third-party planning company or independent planner, um, check it out. It's a great new source of revenue for you. So we will see you next time, and I really appreciate you listening to the show. We appreciate and thank you for listening to the Meetings Podcast. Please email with any questions or comments to meetingspodcast at gmail.com. Meetings Podcast is sponsored by IMAX America, America's worldwide exhibition for incentive travel, meetings, and events. The Meetings Podcast theme music is brought to you by the Delgado Brothers, which can be found at delgadobrothers.com.